Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Barry Erickson and I'm Community Engagement Coordinator at Wheaton Public Library. Tonight, we are delighted to bring you vegetable gardening. There's nothing more rewarding than harvesting your own vegetables. However, getting to that point might seem intimidating. Clark Hudman, owner of Barn Owl Garden Center, is here to discuss how best to plan your plot and choose the plants that will thrive. He will explore the choices between synthetic and organic, as well as the trade-offs between patio, raised, and traditional planting bed styles. With so much expertise and important information to share with us tonight, Clark, I'm anxious to turn the mic over to you. Thank you so much for being here. All right, thanks, Barry. Um, before I get started, I wanna thank you and Wheaton Library for giving us an opportunity uh, to do this presentation. Um, our mission statement is always to be a part of the community. And it's really cool when your own library is asking you to do this. So um, yeah, so thank you. Um, yeah, so let's get started, the fun stuff, right? All right, so when I kind of was going through this presentation, I tried to think about what are the stuff that kind of goes to your mind when you're going out and starting your vegetable garden. So with that in mind, here's kind of the bigger overview here. Um, we're going to look at kind of organic versus synthetic. Uh, then we're going to try and think about, well, what space do we want to grow in? And the best idea to do that is thinking of a garden plot versus a raised bed versus container. These are kind of your three most popular ways to do outdoor gardening. Um, from there, we'll look at kind of what vegetables we like to grow, when we should grow them, and kind of get an idea of what they may need and all that fun stuff. And then the hard part kind of maybe is planning out your garden, thinking about where stuff should go. Um, and then the last one we're going to look at is problems that you may occur and this will kind of overlap with organic versus synthetic as well because a lot of these problems are going to have to be done either organically or synthetically so with that we're going to start with thinking about organic versus synthetic and before i go to the next slide i will say um organic in my definition is going to be something that comes from the earth um synthetic will be something that is artificially made or man-made um, the distinction for the organic is you could be using something that is organic that may not be certified, like OMRI certified, for example, organic. Um, OMRI does a great job distincting that stuff. Um, just for our purposes, we'll just kind of think of man-made versus made by Mother Earth. So um, the big thing that I look at when I think of synthetic versus organic, synthetic is a very short-term route. So you're thinking about the importance of what's happening with the plant. Where when I think about organic, I think about what is going on underneath the soil and how are we building a better maybe micro ecosystem for the plant, making it more self-sufficient. Um, and with that, one has a much more rapid reward. Uh, however, the plant kind of becomes more reliable on you. Where long-term organic, the plant becomes more kind of self-reliant. Um, so that's kind of the easy way to think of it. One is going more towards a plant year in and year out, where the other one is you're kind of creating an ecosystem where that plant can thrive. So we're going to talk about here more on the feeding parts of synthetic versus organic. And um, the one big thing synthetic fertilizers, especially in our modern time, kind of focus on is NPK. Um, kind of the way to think about that, these are the big macronutrients for the plant. So N stands for nitrogen. Nitrogen is gonna be what kind of creates that big green bushy growth. Um, nitrogen is gonna be something the plant will take up even if it doesn't need it. Um, so then the next is P. P stands for phosphorus. This is gonna be kind of your bottom root density root growth here. Um, the thicker your roots are, the more it can feed and the more that transitions into your nice fruit or veggies. Um, and the last is K. K is the elemental sign for potassium. This is for root density, root kind of thickness. This will help with disease resistance um, and so forth. Uh, now, as I talked, touched on with nitrogen, nitrogen, the plant will take up no matter what. So when you're using a high nitrogen fertilizer, you're gonna have to remember um, that plant will take it even if it doesn't need it. Um, kind of like, you know, me with a quart of like sherbet or something, I am probably gonna polish off that entire thing, even if I don't need it. Um, and you're gonna see kind of negative things happen with that. You're gonna see burning in the plant. 
um, and it's not going to be very healthy for the plant. Um, and it's also a very important to remember, especially when we're doing fruits and veggies, <clears throat> that you're going to want to have all these micro and secondary nutrients that will be very key to the life and the production of the plant. So <clears throat> if you're feeding a triple 10 with your tomatoes, you may find later that you have some um, blossom end rot or calcium deficiency. <clears throat> so it's very important to think about feeding this plant through the entire life cycle for everything it needs. Um, and that kind of leads into following the directions, especially with these big heavy nitrogen fertilizers because you don't want to burn it and it's not great. Uh, kind of bums you out, especially in the middle of July when you burn out your plant or whatnot. Um, so this goes, next to organic. So organic fertilizers will always, they'll also have your NPK for the most part, um, unless you're using different L, L, um, single ingredients or other um, elements, stuff like that. Uh, but it's always going to be lower. And the big thing, especially with organic gardening, is making that soil become alive. So uh, with a lot of that, you're going to get some awesome mycorrhiza, some great beneficial fungi. And the big thing these guys do is they help chew away these key ingredients that the plant needs and make it more digestible for the plant as it grows through its life cycle. So some of these will attach to the root system and some will live throughout the soil. Um, that's kind of when, um, like, I really nerd out when you like have a really nice black dirt. Um, that's kind of the feeling you get with that. And they also play a nice role throughout the life cycle. And some of these will inoculate it. Things like soybeans will actually help produce fruit. Um, the one, two, the couple things that I see a lot of that people should just be aware of. Um, one is going to be manure, uh, especially when you're talking about stuff that we're eating. You want to make sure this manure is fully composted. Um, all the bacteria is kind of burned away from it, uh, which usually I kind of recommend if you're passing a horse stall and it has free manure at the side of the road. Maybe if you want to take it, dig very deep at the hottest part of it. And then I still wouldn't recommend putting that near veggies or herbs or anything, um, just with disease and whatnot. And the other one is um, rain barrels. Rain barrels are awesome. It's a great way for us to preserve water. I recommend to folks to use that on your flowers and stuff like that. And the big thing is what's coming off of, what's coming into your rain barrels, what's coming off your roof, from your gutters, um, same idea. So it, it kind of could be ripe with bacteria. So, and especially if uh, you're probably not the best at, you know, cleaning stuff and you want to like picking out of your garden. Um, you know, like for example, I love picking peas and just taking them right off the vine. Um, maybe that's something you just focus on with your flowering stuff. All right. Now we're going to kind of go in, now that we kind of decided, um, if we want to kind of push more organic or more synthetic. Um, and I'll be honest, I am one of those people that will use it. I prefer organic. I think for the longevity of our environment, it's better. But sometimes you have an insect problem, something like that. You have to go more towards synthetic route. And also it's the synthetic. It is a little bit easier um, to add organics in there because you're going to get more of that well-rounded nutrients to your plant. So now that we're kind of touching on that, um, the next thing is kind of planning out what you're going to do with your garden. Um, so kind of the three most popular ones are going to be your garden plot, your raised bed, and your container. And there are a myriad of different ways that you could garden. And there are a bunch of people that have done some pretty awesome stuff from aquaponics to hydroponics, stuff like that. But we'll kind of focus in on what you're doing in your backyard. Um, and with that, we'll start with the garden plot. Kind of your old school, what grandma and grandpa did, type way of gardening tried and true. And it's even better now because our different villages and cities and counties offer free garden plots for us to use. So the big pro with that is it's very inexpensive. You're literally just either picking a piece of your backyard, tilling it up, and there's your garden plot. And you can have as many square feet as you'd like. Um, and this kind of allows you to have a wider variety of different plants grown in that area. Kind of the cons is its location determinant. So let's say, for example, you have a 250 square feet in your backyard or, you know, and you think that's going to be great, but unfortunately you have a lot of oak trees. Um, it's shade determinant. Let's say where the ground's pitched, it's going to flood. Um, 
it really just relies on having a nice location for this garden plot. And the other next thing is preparing the soil. Um, especially if any of you folks are in kind of newer builds, you may notice you have a pretty heavy clay soil, partly because they take the clay that was where your basement was and they re-level your, uh, your backyard or front yard and kind of cover that topsoil. So that's stuff that shouldn't be seeing the earth for another 20, 30 years. Um, and so what you're gonna have to do is start amending it and working on it. And really it's, it could be a lot of work getting it prepared for that time. Um, and the next thing is it's very permanent. So kind of once you put your garden plot there, it's not like you could kind of change your mind. Um, it's kind of a lot of work to get it there. So you just gotta be sure you know where you want it, you got the right spot and you're ready to go. So the next one is the most popular, your raised bed. Um, the nice thing with the raised bed is you're starting from scratch. So you're creating the soil, you can pretty easily adjust the pH, you can use the organic matter you like, you can create this awesome loamy black dirt um, that just has gets plenty of aeration in it. Um, and the other thing is it kind of creates a nice barrier. So it deters some pests from getting in there and eating it. Um, but as I found out where there's a will, there's a way. So a lot of these guys are going to figure it out anyways, but it kind of deters them that way. Um, and the nice thing is it can be placed virtually anywhere. Like most common are about four by eight feet, but you can do any dimension you'd like. Um, when I think about raised beds, the biggest thing I kind of recommend folks is one, find a place that's nice and sunny for it. But two is put it in a place where you're gonna kind of be at a lot. So like a great example is, let's say you like to do Saturday barbecues, put it right next to there, right next to your deck, somewhere where you kind of walk by, where you look at it all the time. Um, a, this helps you kind of make sure you're paying attention to it. So there's no diseases, no critters, nothing getting in it. And B, it kind of lets you interact with it better and kind of better get a feel for what's going well. And I mean, after all, like you put in a lot of work to build this thing and it's going to be a lot of fun. So you might as well like keep it as close to you as you can. Um, and then you get the most interaction out of it. You have some herbs in there, or veggies. You should just kind of go right from your deck or right from like the, your side door pick what you want, chop it up, put in the salad, and you're good to go. Um, the cons with this is it's kind of an upfront investment. Um, you gotta buy the wood um, or buy the kit if you're doing a pre-made one. Um, and you're gonna kind of have to buy everything either to make the medium or make a pre-made medium. Um, and the nice thing is just an initial investment, kind of when you make that soil, it's there. Now you're just maybe topping off, adding more nutrients. but kind of that upfront cost could be a little cost inhibitive. Um, and once again, just like the last guy, you're gonna need this, it's, once you place it there, it's not moving. So you're just gonna need a place that gets nice, good sun. Which leads us to our last one, the container. Um, the container is either for some of us, that's kind of your only option if you have limited space, which is a big plus for this. Um, you, you can move it around. So if you're in kind of an established place that has a lot of trees, you don't have a lot of sun, and you're neurotic like I am, I you just move your plant kind of around your patio so it follows the sun with it. Um, and this is also a great add-on if you have a raised bed or a garden plot, but maybe you don't have enough sun or enough space. So you can add this to it. Um, so yeah, you like you kind of have that small footprint, so it's not really that big of an issue. Um, the con is this is gonna be by far the most expensive because you're gonna need pots. Um, you're gonna have your soil, your different mediums, most likely a potting soil, something that can air out a little bit better than the other two, because we don't want our plants to sit in soggy feet. Um, and it limits what you're growing. Um, a lot of big fruiting veggies don't do too well in a smaller pot. So, um, so that's kind of another con. I will say for containers, the nice thing that's kind of becoming more and more popular is fabric pots. Fabric pots kind of let air in and out. They're relatively inexpensive. You can use them over and over again, and they don't take up a lot of space in your basement. Um, so your significant other doesn't get mad at you for how much space you're taking up with your planting stuff in a limited space, um, speaking personally. Uh, but yeah, so this is kind of a good uh, way to kind of get around, especially get around 
having taking up a lot of space and all that. So this kind of once you kind of figure out where you're going, kind of what containers, if you're doing a mix and match of what, you have a great space, full sun. Now it's trying to think about, all right, what vegetables do I want? Uh, and when am I going to grow them? Um, and I have an issue where my eyes are too big for my stomach. Uh, so sometimes I will not plan this out correctly. So it's always important to try to think about that. Um, so with these, we'll start with our large fruiting veggies. Um, we'll start with the tomatoes. Tomatoes are going to be like the quintessential summer fruit, fruiting vegetable. Um, they're going to, and I apologize when I say fruit, I mean like horticulturally, horticulturally fruit is going to be the thing that is bearing the seed for the plant. So if I'm using fruit and vegetable interchangeably, I apologize when I say fruit, I mean veggie. Um, but yeah, so your tomatoes, your tomatoes are going to be, um, there's going to be two varieties for our purposes. There's going to be determinate and indeterminate tomatoes. Um, that kind of helps you decide where you're going to grow and what. So your determinate tomatoes are going to be shorter guys. They determinate, so they have a determined height and they have a determined bloom time. They're gonna bloom out, give you your uh, nice tomatoes, and you're pretty much done with that. These, the most popular ones, gonna be like your patio tomato. These are great for small patio areas. Um, you don't need big pots for them. You know what you're gonna get. Um, they're just kind of work like clockwork. The next ones are gonna be indeterminate. And within indeterminate, you have heirloom tomatoes. Now, Indeterminate will kind of keep popping off tomatoes sporadically throughout the summer. You go out there, you pick them. Um, and some of these indeterminates do well in pots. And then you have kind of your heirlooms, which are going to be your super tasty, um, old world type of tomatoes. And these guys tend to need a lot of space. Um, they tend to get big, they're beasts. Um, and they tend to feed a lot. And they do the best, most likely in a ground or in the raised bed, rather than something in a pot. Um, from there, you have your peppers. Peppers kind of come, your hot, your sweet peppers. The nice thing with peppers, they stay nice and tiny. So relatively speaking, compared to our tomatoes, at least. So they can kind of go either in a planter, in the ground, wherever. The one thing I will recommend, um, if you have hot peppers and you have someone in your house that maybe doesn't like spicy, I'd try and separate a little bit, maybe off to row, your sweet peppers and hot peppers. Because sometimes what can happen, they cross pollinate, and you may have a poblano pepper that is a little bit hotter than what you're used to. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And then the next is the cucurbit family. So that goes from watermelons, muskmelons, cucumbers, squash, zucchini, all that good stuff. Um, they do make uh, most of these guys. You're going to have to do in the ground. You can trellis these guys um, to help save space. Um, either using an A-frame or something of that nature. Uh, they do make different, like different squashes and cucumbers that do well in patio planters. Um, they kind of stay petite, they'll bush out for you. Um, so that's always an option if, you know, your kind of space is limited for that. Um, but yeah, these guys for the most part are, are gonna be your heavy feeders. So these are ones that um, you'll most likely be wanting to feed uh, kind of in the flowering phase of the plant. So usually you'll get away if you have nice soil through the vegetation phase, and then maybe feeding it during the flowering and fruiting phase to kind of get those nice big fruits. And these guys like the sun. And uh, you'll notice uh, so more for more so for the tomatoes and peppers, they love the sun. Um, and they'll drink a lot of water for all these guys. For those cucumbers and the cucurbits sometimes they do like a little cooler area so if you do have something that gets that nice morning sun it'll kind of help with that so from there the next big popular one is your herbs um you're, you're gonna have your basil is cilantro thyme oregano rosemary and on and on and on um now the biggest thing herbs are nice and easy these guys uh i tend to keep them maybe a container is great uh, when we're talking about early summer, late spring, leave them in the full sun. But when we start getting in the hotter months, I tend to like to give them morning sun 
um, and then maybe or a filtered sun because what happens when they get really hot they tend to like to bolt um, a plant's life cycle is they the seed germinates it gets nice green and bushy it feels like it's time to go so it'll flower and go to seed and we really want the leaves on the herbs that's the big key so one big recommendation I just tell people is when you pick it don't pick leaf by leaf just kind of clip it at the node so kind of where the, the leaves pop out right above there kind of like the armpit I guess and then pick the leaves from there this will kind of force the plant to think oh I need to kind of push out um more leaves and get bushier um this kind of keeps it nice and bushy um the only other thing is the two I would not ever recommend putting in your garden is thyme and mint um these guys like to spread and if they go to seed they'll be all over your lawn and you'll be wondering kind of why your backyard smells like a Miami nightclub and you have mint mojitos uh, whenever you cut it. Um, so these guys I'll keep in a container, keep away from the soil uh, because they love to spread. This kind of goes to our cold weather veggies, which I'm sure lots of you guys have got started right now. Um, these are great for starting early. You're gonna have your brassicas and your leafy greens. Um, the reason these are cold weather, they are totally cool with the frost. They are fine getting put in the ground now. Um, and you usually tend to harvest them around mid-May or so. Uh, and then having that secondary season coming in the fall. So you kind of get two off seasons with it. The nice thing with these guys too, they don't take a lot of nutrients up. So um, you don't have to worry about them kind of depleting your soil of different nutrients. Um, and kind of with the lettuce goes the same way. We don't want any of our leafy greens bolting, just like our herbs. Um, so if you like, especially the leafy greens going year round, sometimes I'll move it from that sunny area and try and transplant into more of a shaded area in your garden. And then that should make it happy for the rest of the year. Um, and that goes if you want to do summer brassicas. If you ever notice you have broccoli or cauliflower, um, they tend to hate the sun and they kind of get yellow. Um, if it's in full sun. So sometimes maybe starting it in a sunnier area when it's cooler like this and then moving it kind of more into a filtered sun shaded area. Um, and then that way it kind of keeps cool and it's super happy. And then you can have broccoli for days. Um, but yeah, so everything else I missed are gonna be your beans and your peas and your root veggies, which you could be starting right now. Um, potato is a good rule of thumb is Easter or when the forsythias go, you can put them in the ground. Um, and a lot of these, you can start from seed. They're super easy. They're a lot of fun to do with the family. Um, they kind of come in really cool colors. Uh, it's kind of cool to, especially like with radishes and turnips and beets and carrots and stuff. It's kind of fun, like give them to your, for me, give them to my niece and nephew. They put in the ground and then they pull it out. And, you know, it's kind of like a Bugs Bunny feeling, I guess. And, but yeah, so, and then the last one is gonna be your strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, and grapes. Strawberries be a little bit different than these guys, the other ones. Strawberries are gonna kind of be, will reseed themselves throughout the year and they'll kind of spread. Um, you'll have June bearing and ever bearing strawberries. June bearing means they will fruit in June and that's it. Ever bearing will be smaller fruits, but you can kind of get them throughout the year. Um, from there, you have your bushes, so your raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries. Raspberries and blackberries do very well in this area. Um, they're very happy in our soil. And the cool part, especially for all of our patio gardeners, there are different cultivars now that stay dwarfed that you can actually keep in a pot. And um, they're not going to be a giant bramble um, that a lot of us are probably used to. Um, blueberries, they like it more acidic. So they like the other part of like going on the other side of Lake Michigan um, and kind of getting that more sandy acidic soil. Um, so when you get those, there are cultivars that do well and more of a pH neutral or um, just amending the soil either with a nice organic sulfur-based fertilizer um, or just sulfur um, and kind of keeping that down. And then grapes will be a vine. Um, important thing if you're starting grapes, they will only grow fruit on second year wood. So if you plant grapes, just wait for the second year, and then you'll be seeing fruit and flowering off of that. 
All right, so this is where our engineers will probably love it. Um, and I'm not too good at, but kind of planning out your garden and getting it ready and um, doing all that fun stuff. So the first thing I always tell people is kind of in your head, make like a wish list of what stuff you'd like to grow, what vegetables, what herbs you'd like to see. And then when you're kind of doing this, put in, keep in mind what the sizing is going to be. So um, this is kind of where the containers come in handy. So let's say you really wanted that fifth type of variety of cherry tomato. Maybe that goes in a container because everything else is kind of getting too crowded within your garden. Um, or you just say, let's cut it and kind of give our room to our cucumbers or whatnot. Um, this kind of helps with the soft ranking. Um, and worst case, you can just always build a garden in your neighbor's yard and send them the bill later. Uh, that may work. I, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. Uh, but yeah, so I will say too, um, this couple years with COVID and everything, all our tried and true gardeners, I know May 15th is always kind of the year that you start putting stuff in the ground. Um, no matter what, you guys have always been more disciplined than me because I always say May 1st, I'm going to try it. And if not, I'm going to rip the bed sheet off and figure it out. But we have noticed like within the last year or so, it's been harder to get our hands on more unique or different varieties. And just the supply chain's kind of a little wonky right now. So if you know there's a specific type of veggie you'd like, uh, maybe just look, try to get your hands on it um, and baby them, just putting them outside during the day, bringing them in inside and then planting them May 15th. Um, just kind of our initial thing. It's kind of going to be maybe a little, another weird year, but at least it'll be a weird year and we are vaccinated. So that's cool. Um, and, but yeah, so garden placement is big. And I know we touched on it with kind of what style of gardening you want to do, but it's very important um, because it keeps the plant happy. Um, things you want to think about is sun, space, and airflow. Um, airflow will be important. We'll touch on it later, but that helps prevent disease. The more air the plant gets, it kind of helps prune the, um, especially in a raised bed or if you have nice rows, it helps kind of prune the root system, um, which helps them kind of take in more nutrients, which helps them feed, which is more fruit. Um, so when you look at your area, it's kind of nice to make kind of a rough grid and thinking about your different square footages um, and then start planning your groupings of plants within those areas. So then A, they can help pollinate one another and then, um, kind of helps you give a better picture of where everything's going. Um, and as far as sun, especially um, kind of when we're talking about the classics, our tomatoes and peppers and stuff like that, you're gonna wanna make sure if you have an area but with full sun, that's gonna be where they're gonna be the happiest. So think about that full sun. Um, one thing I kind of do is uh, a lot of us carry our phones with us. So I'll kind of look at a place to snap a picture and then if I remember either later in the day or a different part, maybe snap a picture in the middle of the afternoon and see, all right, is it, when does the sun come up? All right, so I'm approximately getting this many hours of sun. Yeah, this is a full hour, full sun area. And this is actually great advice for um, um, your perennial beds and stuff as well. Um, yeah, and then if it doesn't work for you, the containers are always a great option. So, um, kind of the timing of this harvest is great. That's kind of a nice part where you can have your two different plants coming in and out. Um, and uh, so you can kind of pull them or move your cool season plants into cooler areas um, and translating them that way. Um, for spacing, like anything in that cucurbit family, um, an easy way to remember that, they kind of all of them pretty much have that fuzzy leaf. Um, those guys are gonna take up a lot of space. Tomatoes too, more vertically. Um, I know like when you're thinking, oh, the tomato just gets tall, but it kind of will also take away from the sun. So kind of thinking about where you put them together. Um, and if you have limited room for tomatoes, maybe thinking about determinate or maybe an indeterminate that isn't an heirloom. Um, heirlooms are gonna take, need, you know, about three feet of space um, to be really happy and to kind of prevent disease and get them going. Determinants, you can get away with a foot and a half to two feet. Um, 
peppers, small guys. So they kind of need one to two feet. Um, they kind of love the summer. So they like that hot, humid um, weather. Uh, for beans, um, there's two varieties, bush beans and pole beans. Um, bush beans, you, I kind of, if you're doing it in a row, you kind of keep them six inches apart. And then in the row, about two to three feet away. And if you're doing a mound, um, if you're doing pole, I'd like to, I'd like to mound them up a little bit and then keep them about three to four feet apart. Um, a kind of nice tool that you see is the um, bamboo pyramid trellis. I kind of put one on each corner and let them climb up together. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of a, it kind of looks cool. And then, especially if you're like tricolor beans and stuff, and then they're always fun to pick away. But always think like whatever plant you get, they'll always come with its little, you know, baseball card. Always read the stats on the back of the card. Um, it'll tell you kind of what spacing um, and how tall it gets. And that always will give you a better idea of that spacing and always kind of try and keep yourself as honest as possible. I know I have difficulty doing that. So, um, but if you know what you're getting into, it always helps starting young. Um, the big thing, especially for our, um, our garden plot folks is making sure you rotate your garden. So every few years, those big fruiting veggies, let's put them in an area maybe where you kept the herbs or your leafy veggies, things that don't take a lot of nutrients because um, these like your tomatoes and everything, they will suck the nutrients out. So we just wanna make sure even if we're amending it, just rotating it every few years if we can, um, it'll keep everything happy. Even in raised beds, uh, that should be the kind of the case as well. Um, the nice thing with raised beds, when you have a garden pot, the nutrients are gonna spread a lot quickly kind of within a soil. So you don't have to worry about as much, but that could be an area of concern. And the next thing is doing a cover crop is always a fun, easy way to pump nutrients back in to your soil. Um, cover crops are what a lot of farmers, especially back more so back in the day, would plant kind of a season of these crops because they actually will emit more nutrients back into the soil than they take out. And then come, if you're doing these in the fall or early spring, then you just till that into the soil and that gives you even more nitrogen kind of going back in there. Um, and like winter rye, sweet pea is a very pretty delicate flower. Oats are super cool. So it's kind of, um, and it's kind of a fun thing to have to do with the family. And you just literally just throw those seeds out there and they grow like nothing. So this is kind of a simple checklist of stuff that you may need um, when you're doing your garden. Uh, and I especially wanna focus on the first one, uh, tomato cages, stakes, uh, the A-frame trellises and regular trellises. Um, a lot of times, you know, we get super psyched and we're uh, starting our garden and we put the tomatoes in the ground and we're fertilizing it, doing everything out, like else right. And all of a sudden the thing's giant, it's kind of leaning over like, you know, one of those car wash things and we don't know what to do. And so people come and looking for a stake and it's a lot more difficult and a lot harder to kind of guide it when it's that mature than it's when it's young. Um, with these tomatoes, especially like heirlooms and whatnot, I like to have my tomato uh, cage and then a stake in the middle. So it kind of guides it straight up. Um, I've also seen people use, kind of make a homemade teepee and guide it with a string as well. Um, A-frames are awesome for your big um, cucurbits. They'll kind of, it kind of climbs up it and then it gives you more airflow and more space in your garden. And it kind of gives a support so that big fruit's not gonna snap off too. Um, trellises are great for your green beans, specifically your peas. Um, and like there are smaller, like your, um, they make like the lemon cube, like the small lemon cukes or the uh, petty pan, uh, zucchini squash, stuff like that. It does a really good job. Um, and planning, yeah, like I said, planning for this is a lot easier. Um, different tools, um, you know, your trowel, any transplant tool, bypass pruners are huge, especially with your fruit, cutting it, making sure you're getting a nice clean cut on these guys. Um, and you will probably find tools that you will need throughout. So just always keeping an open mind. Um, and the other kind of deterrence 
Um, fencing is always going to be a big one, especially, um, you know, these, I love our rabbits, but they're cute and um, crazy and everything, but sometimes they get a little frustrating. So just get rabbit fencing, I'd recommend rather than chicken fencing, um, just because baby rabbits can actually fit through the chicken wire hole. So rabbit fencing kind of will go down or hardware netting is a good option as well. Um, the uh, raised bed, you don't have to worry too much about this, but still chipmunks and stuff can get in there. And then sometimes I recommend putting fencing down on the base. Uh, this will deter any ground dwelling mammal, like a mole, vole, um, anything like that, kind of digging through and taking any of your vegetables. Um, but yeah, and then the bird netting is more gonna be for your fruits and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah. So now we're gonna get to the problems you may find. Um, think talking about funguses, diseases, and insects. Um, there we see some pretty ugly gall mites on a maple. And this looks like black spot on a um, tomato plant there. So with insects, for our purpose, we're just going to group them um, into two groups. Insects with sucking mouthpiece and insects with kind of more chewing mouthpiece. Um, the, this will kind of be easy for you to determine, A, whether it is actually an insect or a disease, but things like aphids have a sucking mouthpiece. So kind of when you, and those are those um, fellows right there to your left. Um, these guys will kind of almost puncture like a straw and suck the chlorophyll out and then kind of have that beaded area. Another thing that you may see on there is um, their honeydew, which is their, their poop. Um, it is in a kind of a black, it'll be a black mold, uh, especially if you see a lot of ants on your plant. Ants will actually farm these dudes and for their honeydew. Um, it's supposedly very sweet. I do not know. I haven't tried it. But uh, if it doesn't and you're seeing big chewing, then that's probably going to be your chewing insects. Um, they're going to be taking, they have kind of the big pincers and they'll be taking big bites out of your plant or you may see them um, edge out, almost turning it into lacewing. So this is kind of where we're gonna to touch back with our organic versus synthetic. And I thought the easiest way to talk about this is kind of what the active chemicals are in pretty much all of your um, herbicides, or sorry, uh, insecticides. So pretty much most uh, garden friendly, garden vegetable friendly insecticides will be some sort of pyrethroid. Um, a pyrethroid mimics more effectively pyrethrin, which is the essential, like the oil that comes out of a chrysanthemum. Um, and kind of what these pyrethroids do is upon touch or eating, it's gonna uh, interrupt the nervous, uh, the nervous system of the uh, insect and kill it. Common ones are carborol, um, there's, there's a lot. Um, like, so it, like if you're getting seven or eight, um, or any of those, most likely that will be it. Um, the one thing I do always recommend to folks, make sure when you're buying an insecticide, it is labeled for garden and vegetable. Um, and also make sure you are not using a uh, systemic in that. Um, systemics like neonics and hemocolpras and whatnot um, kind of go in through the vascular. That's usually when you hear, when the directions are just pour on, it's gonna go through the vascular system. And that means it's going to go into our fruits and into our vegetables. Um, the next are going to be kind of, once again, organic, found or created naturally here on earth. Um, the first one is going to be pyrethrin, kind of what we were talking about before. It's going to be based off of the chrysanthemum. The next is going to be neem, which is a tree out of India. Um, this is a good miticide. Let's go with aphids. Um, unlike pyrethrin, it really only kills on contact. So if you're seeing the buggers, you squirt them and it, it'll do the trick. It also has some good, um, it works well as a fungicide too. Um, and this is a very, it's a much more mild organic option than pyrethrin. You, I mean, you can find it really in your shampoos and conditioners as well. Um, the next one, spinosad, which is going to be kind of the remnants like that's found like left over actually in rum barrels. Um, the idea with these, is you spray it on your plant, they start eating it. 
they get sick and they croak. Um, so with these, especially, um, it's going to take a while for them to to die. So you're not going to be able to spray them and watch get. I mean, I don't know, instant gratification. I don't know, but you're not gonna um, you're not gonna see them die right away. So they have to ingest it and then they'll die. Um, the next one kind of they kind of move in together is insecticidal soap, um, which you can either make yourself, um, you can get uh, at a garden center. Um, mineral oil is another good one. Um, a lot of these remedies, same idea. How a lot of these work is when you spray it, it gets on them and it clogs up their sphericals. So they breathe out of their abdomen. If you think like an air filter, clogs it up and that's how they die. Um, with all of these, um, more so with the pyrethrin and like a lot of your synthetic ones. I always recommend if you're doing it, always cover up the flower or try to avoid that flower as best you can. Um, you just don't want our pollinators to come into contact with it. They're doing us a solid by pollinating our garden. So we'll keep them safe. Uh, but yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So I guess there's gonna be one other one that we haven't touched on. And that is our ground dwelling. Sorry, I had a you know, my computer. We have the ground dwelling guys, snails, and underground characters. So with synthetics, they're going to be very similar chemical structures as what we previously saw, as we now know when they kind of touch, come into contact with this, um, it's going to kill them. So kind of if they touch it, they're done. Um, as for the organic measures, um, the couple options would be diatomaceous earth, which is going to be a stone element that's ground really finely, almost almost looks like crushed limestone. And you spread this um, on the soil underneath it, it'll cut up our insects and kind of will slowly dehydrate them. And then the other great one, especially if you're, have, if you're having weevil issues or anything kind of on the roots or in your potatoes is BT. BT is going to be a beneficial bacteria that will not impact us, but will kill any ground dwelling insect. Um, it's also really good for if you have fungus, gnats, or any house plant issues. Um, as for slugs and snails, oyster shells, iron, same idea, anything that cuts it up. I always recommend if you tend to have a problem area in that place, start early and put it down. Um, and then the diatomaceous earth will work as well. Um, and then other remedies, like you could do the beer can and all that stuff. Um, I like to save my beer. So, so yeah. Um, so now we'll move to fungus. Um, there's going to be a whole host of fungus that um, we'll kind of, we'll see pop up and we especially tend to see it pop up when it gets a little bit warmer, a little bit more humid, um, kind of their ideal times. Um, the only way to really deal with fungus is prevention. Um, all fungicides will kind of act as a bonding agent to the leaf and it uh, deters the fungus from attaching itself. Um, and this also goes with the fruit. So um, like chlorothalonil is gonna be pretty much what your synthetic is gonna be um, with this. Uh, it's gonna last a little bit longer on the plant than your organic ones. So that's kind of when will you see people use that. Your organic will be sulfur and copperous. Um, these you're going to have to do throughout the year. So um, I usually recommend, you know, starting by, if you want to wait a little bit, you could probably start by Memorial Day. But if you have had an issue um, with a plant that has had a fungus, especially in your garden, um, keep, think about that now, because it'll probably come back year after year, because since fungus is spread based on spores, the spores are probably living in your soil. Um, so it's always good and to start with prevention, um, especially like, let's say, you know, you have your cucumbers or squash and you plant the same year and every time come July 4th, it, the leaves are white with downy mildew. You don't know what's happening. Um, that's gonna be because those spores are living there and they're just waiting um, for the heat to crank up and the party to get started. So um, always kind of spray them down um, and uh, way prevention going with this, is going mechanically, so getting adequate airflow. If you're seeing it on leaves, remove the leaves um, so it doesn't spread. And then uh, another good thing is kind of planning your watering schedule 
in the morning. The reason for that, they have time to drink. It's going to, the soil will stay damp and it'll kind of naturally dry out a little bit. So you're not having that overnight dampness through the humidity. Um, and then when you're watering, if you're having an issue, try not to splash the soil around. Since these are spores, once they go airborne, they're going to be looking for a host. So those are kind of other ways to kind of prevent that. Um, and then the big one is going to be man-made issues. Um, inconsistent watering is going to be one that's, uh, you know, going to be, you know, maybe you're not watering either at the right time of the day or you're just not doing it frequently enough. Um, I always recommend it's better to water less days a week and just water more thoroughly on the days. So maybe just doing every few days or so and just really watering it that will allow the roots to kind of grow a little bit deeper um, there's going to be more water in the soil less will evaporate um, and then kind of it kind of forces that root system to spread out a little bit um, and when you kind of water consistently the plant stays strong that's where it's going to be able to kind of fight off especially for organic gardeners it's going to be able to fight off our insects and our diseases a little bit better um, just like anything in nature, the more health, the healthier it is, the more easily it kind of fend off sickness or illness. Um, and they kind of touched it before, water in the morning is awesome. Um, rather than night, then we don't have to worry about diseases. Um, but if you can't, let's water in the evening. Um, that way the water has a chance to stay in the soil rather than in the heat of the summer when we're in the drought, that water may tend to evaporate. Um, another big thing is fertilization burn. Um, they kind of touched on the synthetics. They tend to have super high MPK. The plant doesn't necessarily need that. Um, so we want to make sure we are um, kind of fertilizing it adequately. So for nitrogen, you tend to only want to do it one, uh, one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Um, so a little bit goes a long way. And um, like you have to remember too, if you're fertilizing, during the fruit and veg stage of your plant in the summer. Um, when the plant eats, especially nitrogen, it's gonna to need to drink. So um, yeah, so we don't wanna leave it with cotton mouth, I guess, and just remember to feed it. I also recommend in this hot summer months, to going away from more nitrogen and going more phosphorus based and especially more micro secondary nutrient foods um, to kind of help promote that fruit and the, the vigor there. Um, there's a lot more to add to this. And I think the thing is we kind of, sometimes we get super excited, super amped up. We like love our child too much, these, our tomatoes and whatnot. And sometimes you just overthink it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, it kind of happens and we all kind of want to see everything thrive. And sometimes we just do it. And like, like a lot of times that means overwatering, over fertilizing. Um, you know, and maybe putting the insecticide on during the middle of the day, burns it, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, as long as we're having fun doing it, we'll kind of learn naturally from there. Um, yeah, so that's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to open up for questions. Before I do so, I just want to say I learned so much from you guys. So if there's a question I can't answer, um, I will ask you if you can, um, Barry's going to send out like the uh, conclusion email and I'll have our social info and I believe our email on it. Um, and if not, you can get on our website and get that and send me the questions. I would love to answer it. And um, yeah, that's all I got. Well, thank you so much, Clark. This has been wonderful. Tons, tons of great information there. Uh, I do have a couple of questions queued up already, and I will remind everyone, if you want to go ahead and open up your Q&A window, the icon for that is along the bottom edge of your screen, usually a little bit to the right of the center. It says Q&A. If you pop that open, that's the place to enter your questions. So I will uh, start uh, getting those ready for you then, Clark. Uh, our first question is about uh, how to prevent or treat um, that powdery mildew on pumpkins. And I think you referred a little bit to this towards the end of the presentation. I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to say uh, about taking care of that. Yeah, um, A, for like, so like when you put your pumpkins in then, I would just start uh, putting your fungicide on it and most of those cycles will be between 10 days and two weeks. 
Uh, and then if you can get airflow with it, I don't know. Sometimes if you like you're building, like you're gonna be growing those big old beasts um, there, you're not gonna be able to trellis it. So then just thinking about airflow. So maybe in an area that's kind of nice and open where you know the wind's gonna be going through. Um, fungus likes hot, humid, and stale. So um, it would love Florida in July, but, um, but yeah. Okay, another question. How do you prevent bottom rot on tomatoes? And I think they're asking if possibly adding calcium is an option. Exactly. So that's kind of what we're talking about with synthetics. A lot of times they only have those three macronutrients. So it's very important to make sure we're giving the plant all its nutrients it needs. So yeah, so calcium is going to be what it needs. And I know, especially if you see the issue, a lot of people will put eggshells in it. But the issue is those eggshells need to be broken down. And this, we touched on with organic gardening. It gets broken down by something. So usually that's our bacteria, our beneficial bacteria, microbes, stuff like that. But if it's you're seeing it, it may be better just to get a calcium agent that will kind of get in there and kind of get into the plant more quickly than the decomposition of like eggshells or coffee or something like that. Great, great, thank you. Uh, we just had that question about pumpkins and here's kind of a follow-up. Uh, anything to stop the squirrels from eating uh, pumpkins? <laughs> Um, I have two dogs you could borrow. Uh, no, um, blood meal works. It's a good fertilizer. And since they're herbivores, they'll kind of stay away from that. Uh, uh, people use like capsicum, um, like which is going to be hot pepper. Uh, and the other one would be like castor oil. Um, uh, castor oil, just like us, it kind of gets us sick. Um, but like, and a lot of essential oil mixes kind of work with that. Like um, humans are really the only thing that likes mint and like spearmint and stuff. So spraying with that, but, um, but even then, I mean, if a squirrel's desperate, it's going to kind of eat anything, but those are kind of good deterrents for sure. Okay. Uh, speaking of squirrels and things, someone is also asking about, uh, rabbit fencing. Is, do you have any tips for that? Yeah. So you want to make sure, um, the holes go from big to small on it. They, uh, or get like a hardware wire, like chicken fencing, the baby rabbits can like pop right through there and eat it. And then just putting it about four to six inches, like a few, a few inches, I would say maybe four to six into the ground. So they can't kind of dig underneath there as well. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, how about, um, how, do, how do we attract pollinators? Um, that's a great question. So, um, you are going to need, uh, kind of the plants they like the most. Um, so things that will kind of push off the most pollen and also the colors. So a lot of our native pollinators will kind of tend to go to more native species. Um, and when I say native, you know, probably within about 150 miles or so of this area. Um, and they kind of like more natural or natural coloring. So when you think of that, you're thinking of nice warm colors, yellow, um, red, orange, white, stuff like that. Um, but like the thing that bees love that if you're, if you're looking for vegetable garden to be clover, um, clover will pollinate way more than like an echinacea, for example. But like, when you think about that, echinaceas are great, um, Moderna, Black Eyed Susans, things like that um, would be all great. And then, um, yeah, and then they'll probably make their way to your vegetable garden and make your fruit veggies taste way better. Sounds great. Uh, there's a couple questions about plant timing. Uh, when should you plant uh, broccoli and beans? Um, broccoli, you can start right now. Um, broccoli is cold weather, so it kind of has the same rule of thumb. Um, like when the forsythias bloom, you can put in the ground. It's gonna, we have wonky spring, winter, summers here. So like, you never know when it's gonna snow, but they're gonna kind of push through it. And beans, if you're starting from in with seed, you can kind of start those now. Um, if they're plants, I would kind of let them hang out inside, maybe during the day, um, bring them out, let them get that natural sun. And then um, if you do plant them early, uh, I would just protect them from uh, our cold weather. So anytime, like I think tonight is about 35, I would get a little nervous. So anytime we get close to freezing, just try and protect them. 
Okay. Uh, and for planting the bed, uh, should you plant root vegetables such as beets away from tomatoes or green beans? Um, I will plant them a little bit away just because since they're a little bit lower, you have an issue with it getting the adequate sun. Um, so I kind of line them up um, with kind of your smaller vegetables. So like if you have lettuce, onions, um, stuff like that. Great, great. And when do you plant cover crops? Um, either, usually when you're all done with your garden. So when everything's kind of picked out, um, usually like around end of Labor Day or so, um, you can kind of plant them. They're very fast germinators. So you kind of see growth there in about a week. Um, and then I tend to just let it grow and the frost is gonna kill it out. And then that'll kind of decompose in that area. And then you just till it up, come early spring. Okay, we've got a couple of questions about um, fertilizers. Uh, thoughts on a product such as miracle Grow? Um, I am not a fan of like the Scott's Monsanto. Um, miracle Grow. Uh, it, the issue is I just don't really like fertilizers that only have three key, key ingredients. Um, and uh, I think there's like, there's some good stuff like if you, especially like water soluble, like Jack's is a very great option. Um, and you can get that at a lot of garden centers. They're bit, pretty much, they've been around forever. Um, and that's a synthetic base like miracle Grow. Um, I would just lean towards that just because they're gonna focus on the different micronutrients that are essential for the plant. Great, thank you. And is there a point when you should stop fertilizing uh, because the fruit is starting to grow? Um, that's a good, it depends if it's going to be more of a determinant plant where it, um, where it's just, you have one cycle and you're done. Um, what I will say is trans transitioning your fertilization over. So, um, I will like, I will use something higher nitrogen when I first started planting. And then once I see those flowers pop on the plant, I'll transition it to more something lower nitrogen because I don't really need the green growth anymore, but I would like my, I'd like more fruit. So I wanna try and push off as many flowers as I can um, and try and get as much fruit as that. I will say like, um, I know someone was asking about pumpkins. Pumpkins would be the opposite. If you want like a giant pumpkin, usually what I'd recommend is pulling off some of those flowers. Cause then now when you're fertilizing it, all that energy is getting pushed into making a giant pumpkin for you. Makes sense, great. Uh, someone asked a question about cucumber wilt. Uh, any thoughts on that? They see little yellow uh, beetles with a black stripe and squash bugs and the plants are getting killed. So yeah, cucumber leaf beetle is a, um, gonna be kind of a common beetle. They will love any, anything in that cucurbit family. Um, that is gonna be, I would recommend just if you can applying kind of whatever remedy you'd like to use as an insecticide. Um, and sometimes, especially cause they'll kind of be more ground dwellers, maybe trying to apply there. Um, but yeah, so cucumber leaf beetle, especially comes in kind of the summer. So just keep an eye for that. And when you're applying it, they will tend to be A, underneath the leaf, and then we'll be feeding in morning and evening. So that's probably the best time to apply that insecticide. Okay, and sort of a follow-up question with that, um, would it help to move the cucumbers to a different part of the plot? If it's a, like like leaf beetle issue, um, they'll find it. Um, but if you're having other issues, like for, especially for diseases, um, they'll, that may be a good option. Um, or, you know, every once in a while, just giving it a new kind of breath of fresh air for getting more nutrients, it's a good idea too. Sure, sure. And just one last reminder, if you have questions to go ahead and enter those in the, the Q&A. Uh, we do have one more here. Uh, is a paper or light cardboard covered with straw a good way to compost? So that's a um, good way to keep weeds out actually. Have your garden bed people use. So uh, using like a light cardboard or compost. For if you're composting, those um, you want more things that are coming from green in nature. So cardboard and straw um, take more work for kind of those microbials to kind of break down. 
So sometimes if you're putting cardboard straw in there, you may want to add something um, like grass clippings, um, like leaf cleanup, uh, stuff like that, that kind of will have more of that natural nitrogen in there. That'll kind of supercharge the bacteria in there to break down that cardboard straw. And uh, I think I know the answer, but uh, where's a, a good place to buy organic seeds that will be uh, well suited to the gardens in our communities around here? So if you're setting me up for a shameless plug, then I'm going <laughs> to take it. Uh, but we, uh, we have the, the Barn Owl, Corner Gary and St. Charles, um, open nine to six tomorrow. Uh, no, but we, uh, we carry cornucopia seeds um, and Renee's garden. Um, we have a wide variety of organic seeds and we will be getting organic seedlings in as well. Um, we pride ourselves on having a pretty good inventory and selection for our organic gardeners, for sure. Okay, um, we've got a question about fish emulsion. Um, is it still good? Yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah, fit, if, if you can stand the smell, this stuff's awesome for your garden. Um, I've made the mistake of using it on my house plants and uh, basically gassed out my whole house, but it's fish emulsion is awesome. And there's um, more and more fish emulsion coming on the market that is focusing more on the bacteria. But yeah, fish emulsion is really good stuff for your garden. Okay. Uh, what amendments um, could be made to uh, help a heavily clay soil? So um, gypsum is gonna be a good one and humic acid. Uh, and then any living microbials as well, um, kind of you add those in there, um, gypsum year after year, you kind of add it. Humic acid will kind of create that natural decomposition. And then um, that good beneficial bacteria, the mycorrhiza, um, especially planting it when you maybe dig your hole, just get some like a living fertilizer. And when those guys get going, they'll kind of chew away at the soil and kind of create that nice black dirt for you. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a couple of times moving plants between um, beds. Someone's asking, um, can you plant tomatoes in the same pot or container from year to year? Um, you can, I would refresh it. Um, so like I was saying, they're super heavy feeders. So um, either if you have a nice heavy feeding schedule and, um, or, you know, uh, just refreshing that soil. The only thing is if you notice you have fungal issues, like let's say a black spot popping up. Um, maybe that's time to get rid of the soil because like I was saying, those spores like to live in the soil. Um, and then that's, or, you know, if you have beds, mite or aphid issues, if they go dormant in there, um, clean it out. Uh, you can use bleach, just bleach out the pot and reuse the pot. Uh, bleach will evaporate. So it's not gonna impact the soil. Speaking of soil, someone's asking, uh, is it okay if there's a lot of small, stones throughout the garden soil yeah um that's going to kind of be natural within our soil um it'll kind of eventually those will break down turn into sand um and uh it'll kind of add a little bit of aeration in it as well um but yeah a little little rocks aren't bad great and here's a great question to end on tonight what are you most excited to plant this year oh um I love, so I have a very small patio. So like, I think I kind of talked about, I'm a container gardener. I, I'll go garden at my mom's house, but um, my mom will get Peruvian peppers. So we'll do that. And like, we get a lot of crazy heirloom tomatoes. So every year I just pick some heirloom tomato and I try and will it to give me tomatoes in a patio garden. And sometimes it works. And sometimes I just have to bring it to my mom's and uh, actually plant into the ground, but, but yeah. Sounds good, sounds good. We certainly wish you luck. Uh, we, wanna, we wanna thank Clark Hudman for generously giving us his time and effort to put together this presentation for us tonight. I will be sending out the link to uh, the Barn Owl Garden Center's website as well as their social media after the presentation tonight so that you can uh, pursue those.
If you are watching the recording of tonight's presentation and you would like the links to those resources, please email me at ce at wheatonlibrary.org. That's ce like community engagement at wheatonlibrary.org. And I'd be happy to send you those links. This program has been recorded so you can watch it again or recommend it to a friend. It will be uploaded to, our, to the library's YouTube page uh, within about a week. So with that, uh, we will say uh, thank you again to Clark. Thanks so much for for helping us out tonight with all and answering all these questions. Uh, and a thank you to everyone who attended tonight. Uh, take care, have a great evening, and we hope to see you again soon. Good night.